Hello, everyone. Today we continue our reading of Liber Abba, or Book 4. And this is going to be a short one today. Today we're talking about the crown. Okay, so let's just open this up. Chapter 11, The Crown. And again, this is Book um, uh, 4, Part 2, uh, Chapter 11, The Crown. The crown of the magician represents the attainment of his work. So, the crown, okay, the crown uh, in ritual magic represents the attainment of your work. It is a band of pure gold, on the front of which stand three pentagrams, and on the back a hexagram. The central pentagram contains a diamond or a great opal. The other three symbols contain the Tau. Around this crown is twined the golden Uraeus serpent with erect head and expanded hood. Under the crown is a crimson cap of maintenance which falls to the shoulders. Instead of this, the Atef crown of Thoth is sometimes worn, for Thoth is the god of truth, of wisdom, and the teacher of magic. The Atef crown has two ram's horns, so now it's describing another ma uh, crown that you can use in ceremonial magic. This crown has two ram's horns. Okay. The Atef crown has two ram's horns showing energy. So the ram's horns, what do the ram's horns on the crown represent? Um, energy, dominion. The force that breaks down obstacles, like butting into things and breaking through, right? So the ram's horns, and also think of Aries and all that. Anyways, the ram's horns um, show energy, dominion, the force that breaks down obstacles. Kind of makes me think of the two of wands. But, um, the two of wands. Um, the, the sign of spring. Between these horns is the disc of the sun. From this springs a lotus upheld by the twin plumes of truth, and three other sun discs are upheld, one by the cup of the lotus, the others beneath the curving feathers. There is still another crown, okay? We will give yet another example, all right? There is yet another crown, the crown of Amun, the concealed one from whom the Hebrews borrowed their holy word, Amen. That's not... Anyways, this crown consists simply of the plumes of truth, but into the symbolism of these it is not necessary to go, for all this and more is the crown is in the crown first described. The crimson cap implies uh, concealment and is also symbolical of the flood of glory that pours upon the magician from above. So the, uh, I'm going to repeat that the crimson cap, Okay, that goes underneath the crimson cap underneath the crown. The crimson cap implies concealment and is also symbolical of the flood of glory that pours upon the magician from above. It is a velvet for the softness of that divine kiss. It's a velvet for the softness of the divine kiss. And crimson for that is the very blood of God which is its life, so the blood of God. It is velvet for the softness of the divine kiss, and crimson for that it is the very blood of God, which is its life. The band of gold is the eternal circle of perfection. The three pentagrams symbolize the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or any other triad, um, while the hexagram represents the magician himself. Ordinarily, pentagrams represent the microcosm, hexagrams the macrocosm, but here it's reversed. But here the reverse is the case, because in this crown of perfection, that which is below has become that which is above, and that which is above has become that which is below. If a diamond be worn, it is for the light which is before all manifestation and form. 
If an opal, it is to commemorate that sublime plan of the all, to fold and unfold an eternal rapture, to fold and unfold an eternal rapture. Um, to manifest as the many, that the many may become one unmanifest. But this matter is too great for an elementary treatise on magic. But let's not mention that in such an elementary treatise as this. The serpent, the serpent which is coiled about the crown, means many things, or rather, one thing in many ways. Okay, so the serpent which is coiled about the crown means many things, or rather one thing in many ways. It is the symbol of royalty and of initiation, for the magician is anointed king and priest. It also represents Hadith, of which one can hear only quote these words, I am the secret serpent coiled about to spring, and my coiling there is joy. If I lift up my head, I and my new eat are one. If I droop down mine head and shoot forth venom, then is a rapture of the earth, and I and the earth are one. The serpent is also the kundalini serpent, the magical force itself, the manifesting side of the godhead of the magician. All right. So the serpent is also the kundalini serpent. Okay, so the serpent crown, the serpent going around. Uh, the serpent is also the kundalini serpent, the magical force itself, the manifesting side of the godhead of the magician, whose unmanifested side is peace and silence, of which there is no symbol. In the Hindu system, the great work is represented by saying that this serpent, which is normally coiled at the base of the spine, rises with her hood over the head of the yogin, there to unite with the Lord of all. The Kundalini. The serpent is also he who poisons. It is that force which destroys the manifested universe. This is also the emerald snake which encircles the universe. This matter must be studied in Lieber 65, where this is discussed incomparably in the hood of this serpent are the six jewels, three on each side, ruby, emerald, and sapphire, the three holy elements made perfect on both sides in equilibrium. Now, because I'm not going to let a quote uh, mm, not be mentioned here, let me do this, okay? Because it mentioned the emerald serpent from Liber 65, which is itself Liber um, Cordi Cincti Serpente. So the book of the, the, the heart girt with a serpent. So that goes into the serpent symbolism. So we're going to take a look here real quick. Let me see here. And that's... Uh, Emerald. Um, mm -mm. All right, here we go. Libra sixty five. I think that was uh, chapter three. Okay, so there's two. Three, let me take a look. Yep, here it is. Y'all ready? All right. Then I beheld myself compassed about with the infinite circle of emerald that encloseth the universe. O snake of emerald, thou hast no time past, no time to come. Verily thou art not. Thou art delicious beyond all taste and touch. Thou art not to be beheld for glory. Thy voice is beyond the speech and the silence and the silence therein. And thy perfume is of pure ambergris that is not weighed against the finest gold of the finest gold. Also thy coils are of... 
What just happened? Mmm. You know, that's really irritating. <laughs> With these lives and everything. I had like a sentence left. You know, it's funny. Ugh. I do a lot of stuff, you know. A lot of magic stuff. It's pretty interesting. Totally unrelated. Mm. Well, I'm not going to go into this video, but it's interesting. Um, we'll, we'll go into this another time. But uh, anyways, so... Okay, not to be superstitious, and I hate to even bring this up, uh, and when, especially when quoting this book, because it's so much about like being objective and stuff. But it's interesting. I've had some uh, interesting uh, electronic stuff since I've been doing uh, a lot of necromancy type of things. It's interesting that my my electrical stuff. However, we're not just gonna draw these kinds of conclusions, right? It's always good to weigh each idea against its opposite and to try to be objective. I've just noticed I've never seen my laptop do that ever. And then, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Yesterday, like, the sound messed up. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm not saying there's a supernatural cause. I've just noticed since uh, with the necromantic stuff and the, like, graveyards and stuff, somehow it seems to affect, like, batteries and stuff in a way, and like electronic. This is not an appropriate video <laughs> for this. Um, anyway, so that is our reading for today. And um, again, we were reading um, book four, Liber Abba, or Liber ABA. Um, and uh, that was uh, part two, chapter 11, The Crown. All right, y'all. Um, this is kind of a short video for y'all today. And um, I will see y'all in the next video. Hope everyone's having a wonderful day.